Hey everybody, uh, glad, it, glad you could make it today. Um, I try to do these live streams every month and uh, last month I was in Montana so um, I'm trying to catch up now, trying to catch up on my videos, trying to catch up on work. Um, so trying to get a live stream out for July. Uh, and today I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start back with a subject that I was dealing with back uh, before I went on my trip. So I was gone to Montana most, most of June. Uh, to visit my family there. So back before that, uh, one of the last videos I made before I left Arizona was that firing of that um, that canteen. It's this one here in um, in a pit, in pit firing. And so uh, reduction pit firing. So I'm kind of, I'm trying to get back into that now. And I'm going to talk a little bit today about pit firing pottery, um, kind of different ways it was done, different ways it was done in the past in the archaeological record, but also uh, different ways that could be done today the way different people have approached it, uh, kind of the pros and cons of different things. So uh, we can get into all of the, the nitty gritty details of pit firing, uh, but also I'm going to be answering your questions live. So if you have questions, and it doesn't have to be about pit firing, anything related to pottery, uh, just drop them in the chat and I will get to them, uh, try to get to them all answered before the end of the, uh, the live stream today. So I appreciate everybody coming in. Uh, let me see what I have on the chat, make sure I'm, uh, I'm all caught up. Got people here from Texas and uh, Turkey. Um, is my audio okay? Tell me if my audio is good because I've had trouble in the past where uh, my audio level was too low and I didn't know it till late. So uh, if you're having trouble hearing me, let me know. Uh, Fenner, Fenner, I can't pronounce your name. I know that's the new spelling of Turkey, but is that also the correct pronunciation? Do we still say Turkey or uh, are we supposed to say it different? Because uh, the spelling's really, uh, to me, kind of hard. Uh, let's see. Hi there, Andy. Love your content. I am working with wild terracotta clay, but I just can't seem to get my texture plastic enough. Um, uh, yeah, well, uh, some clays just don't have a lot of plasticity. So, uh, the only way to increase the plastic, well, the main way to increase plasticity of your clay is just, uh, to add a, a, a stickier clay to it, something with more plasticity. So, uh, you can age it, uh, you can purify it more, you can levigate it to take out all those impurities, hopefully improve the plasticity. But if those don't work, uh, basically you're you're stuck trying to add some other clay into it to improve it. So a, a lot of times if your clay isn't plastic, uh, it you know, you need to find a better clay. That's that's kind of the the general answer to it. Um could you cover making glazes in nature? A uh, great play says, Can I cover making glazes? Um I will talk about glaze a little bit today, um, but not the way you're probably thinking. So uh, the way I make pottery, I don't glaze. I don't cover the outside of the pot uh, with glaze. Uh, what I do occasionally, and there's some on this pot here, if I can get it to not focus on my face, um, is glaze paint. So the paint itself uh, is glazed. And that's what was done in the prehistoric Southwest. They didn't use all over glaze until much later. And the reason is, uh, we're firing in, in open fires, you know, maybe in a in a pit, but not really a proper kiln. And you need the temperatures of a proper kiln in order to melt glaze. Anything but like a like a lead glaze, which has, you know, health uh, uh, things you should think about because glaze isn't really healthy to eat off of, right? So um, as a general rule, we don't use glaze because in that type of firing, we can't reach temperatures high enough to melt uh, a silica-based glaze. Okay, where am I at here? Uh, glad you're back to your live streams. Hi from South Carolina. This is good to see you here, Amanda. Uh, audio is good, says Cheryl. Thank you for that. Hi from Kansas. Uh, audio good, good. Central Texas, all right. Uh, Kansas, audio is good. Audio great, sorry. I am from South Africa. Um, yeah, no reason to be sorry you're from South Africa. That's cool. Uh, glad you finally made it to the live stream. Hello from Germany, uh, Tampa, Florida. Still trying to get the temper ratio right. Um, yeah, so uh, if you're having trouble with temper, uh, what I usually tell people is 20% is a good starting place, uh, but that's not a hard, fast rule. That's that's merely a gen a very broad general rule. So uh, start with your clay. You've just dug it. Uh, you can add 20% temper to it, uh, but then, you know, work with it. Feel it. Uh, do you find that it's lacking in plasticity? Uh, try cutting back on that. Try try 15%, right? Uh See what you what works for you. Uh, if you have problems, if you put twenty percent in and you're still having problems with cracking, drying cracks, or cra blowing up or cracking in the firing, 
uh, then perhaps uh, you need more temper. Uh, of course, if you add the correct amount of temper that your pottery is surviving, and yet it's still very lacking in plasticity, you might need to find a better clay. I, I think that's the number one ed advice I can give anybody here who's trying to find wild clay to work with. Um, if your clay isn't good, find another clay, right? You're going to find that like 80% of the wild clays out there are kind of garbage. So be ready. Like when you find that clay in your driveway, um, don't marry it. Don't get attached to it. Don't get emotionally involved. And that, I mean, that's, that's not an exaggeration. People literally get emotionally attached to their clay uh, because this one came from my, my yard or I found this one, you know, down the street from my house and I really want it to work out. It might not, uh, but be open to exploring a little more and finding better clays or, or work with that bad clay until you find something better, you know. Uh, do, 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 where am I? Tampa audio's fine. Hello from Roundup, Montana. I, I spent June in Montana, but I, I can't say that I know where Roundup is. Uh, my clay was very high shrinkage rate. Always cracks when drying, even when covered. How do I fix that? Um, yeah, so, uh, so some clays, uh, Ibrahim Al-Amin says that his clay has a real high shrinkage rate and it always cracks. Some clays that have a high shrinkage rate are, are really unusable for pottery. Uh, so we can add more temper. Temper is the main way you're going to affect that. You're going to, by adding temper, you're going to decrease the shrinkage rate. You're going to lose some of that plasticity. But generally those kind of clays that have a high shrinkage rate, high plasticity, also are very sticky. They're hard to deal with. So that adding temper, you're also making it a little more workable in that it's not super sticky anymore. But if you add enough temper uh, to, to make it usable, that it's not, the shrinkage rate is modified uh, uh, and it's still not working, I mean, it's it's time to move on. A, a lot of those clays like that, like bentonites and montmorillonites and those those uh, smectite clays like that have crazy shrinkage rates and, and really high, uh, uh, it'll crack almost every time you dry it, no matter how you do it. So um, that, my first clay I ever found was like that. It was some kind of smectite. I didn't know it. You know, I was 16 years old. Uh, but I just no matter what I made, no matter how much sand I threw into it, I put so much sand, it would almost it would almost have trouble forming a vessel because it was just, you know, it no longer stuck to itself. Uh, but it would still want to crack when it dried because the shrinkage was too high. So uh, again, uh, let's see, your name was uh, Ibrahim. I mean, don't get attached to it. You may have to find something else. And there's probably other clays around. Glazes are only used for mid-fire, like stoneware. Yeah, so so if you're firing outdoors, if you're firing in a primitive situation like I do, um, you'd have really you'd have really difficulty trying to figure out a glaze that would work. Um, and people often tell me, "Oh, you should try salt glazes and stuff." <clears throat> and and some of those that have a, a pretty low glaze point, uh, like salt, um, it's still pretty high for what I'm doing. And even then, I think with salt, you have to have some kind of a a container because it's in the atmosphere. It's kind of um, uh, the salt is forming fumes that are uh, attaching to the pot. And when an open fire, all those fumes would be going out. You have to kind of, you almost need a proper kiln to do some of that. So. Uh, hi from Washington, D.C., Catherine. Thank you. Uh, I like to use 25. It's true, me too. I don't, I don't know what you use that's 25, but okay. Orange, yellow. Why did the clay pot go to therapy? It had a lot of unresolved kiln hood trauma. <laughs> okay, that's great. Uh, clay Playa, what's your thoughts on uh, mix Blue Creek clay 50-50 with yellow post hole clay? And I want to hold water. It just soaks up all the water. Yeah, I, I don't know. You're, I mean, every clay is different. You can't judge it based on the color. Uh, you're just going to have to try that mix, see what you get, and then make decisions based on the working qualities of it. Uh, photo, there are low firing glazes that will require a hotter temperature than typical wood fire gives. I'm still trying to wrap my head around the basics like tempering. Uh, so Hardis uh, Daniel Van Wingard uh, says he's trying to wrap his head around the basics like tempering. So um, tempering just uh, just makes that clay um, uh, more usable. It makes it uh, less likely to crack in the firing and in the drying process. So uh, you add about 20% sand or something like that uh, to your clay body. Any clay that you've dug up, if it's relatively pure... And uh, and then just form something out of it. It's not. It shouldn't be rocket science. I mean, some people try to turn it into it, but it doesn't need to be. When I go to the point of burnishing, my slip tends to smudge and come off. Is that likely a problem with my slip? The only one I made 
Now it's yellow ochre with clay. Um, if you're if you're burnishing your pot, okay, if you're going over your pot with a with a stone and you're burnishing it and it's it's coming off on the stone, your pot's too wet. You need to you need to let the pot dry to just the right level of dryness uh, for burnishing. And so what I do is I'll take my stone and I'll just just lightly, maybe on the bottom or someplace where it's not going to matter as much, and just lightly stroke it with the stone and, and then look and see if it's coming off on the stone, uh, wait, let it dry some more. If it's f making it glossy and it's not coming off on the stone, it's perfect and you try to do it all over. And sometimes the whole pot won't be at that level of dryness at the same time. So maybe your rim is ready to polish, but the bottom's still too wet. Just polish the rim, keep going down until you get to a spot where it's starting to stick to the stone a little bit and then let it dry a little more. Your goal should be to make that pot dry as evenly as possible, but that's not always possible. Okay, um, where was I? Uh, Suzanne, when I get to the point of burnishing, oh, I read that. Theo says, I have no idea what any of this means. I found this channel a few days ago and found it interesting enough to subscribe and learn something new. All right, Theo, well, um, we're gonna learn something new today. Uh, I'm gonna talk about pit firing pottery and I've got a bunch, I don't know how many, I've got. I've got a bunch of slides to show you, photos uh, of different things, uh, things in archaeology, uh, things that I've done in the past. We're going to talk a lot. We're going to go on a deep dive, if you will, about pit firing pottery uh, in the past and then today. So it doesn't matter if you know any of this, Theo. Uh, there's something to learn here today. So if you don't mind, uh, hit the like button. That'll help me do better in the, um, uh, you know, the algorithm, the YouTube algorithm. So, um, Give me a like and we will move forward with this. And then I'll come back to the comments as I go forward so that uh, I don't miss any of your uh, you know, questions. Go ahead and drop those questions whenever you have them. All right. So let's go to the, uh, let's go to the slideshow. And first we're going to talk about um, uh, who, who likely pit fired in the past. So <clears throat> when it comes to um, archaeological evidence of, of firing, uh, pretty much most of the Southwest, this is the map of the American Southwest. Most of this, uh, we have very little archaeological evidence of firing pottery. We have the pottery, so we know that they indeed, excuse me, we know that they fired pottery. We just, we just have no evidence of how they did it because archaeologists have found no kilns in most of this country. Not all, but most. So the main place we have evidence of firing kilns is up at the very top, uh, what they call the Four Corners area. It's called Four Corners because those four states, Arizona, Utah, Colorado, and New Mexico come together. It's the only place in the United States where four states come together. Um, so up there in the Four Corners area, they have <clears throat> these Mesa Verde style trench kilns. And they're and I'll show you some pictures. They're long, rectangular, large kilns surrounded by, they're, they're lined with stone slabs and they're fired inside of. That's the only place we have evidence. Uh, and so... I used to make this assumption, all right, since we only find trench kilns in the Four Corners area, all of these other people must have been firing on the surface of the ground because otherwise we would find evidence of their kilns. I, I think that's a fair assumption, but I'm now, given my recent uh, experiments, and you can go back and watch that video about the, um, uh, the, the canteen that I did, I don't know, back in maybe May, uh, go back and watch that, and I, I'll go a little more detail about um, how I came to this conclusion. But I'm thinking now that a lot of this pottery that is made across this area had to have been fired in a hole in the ground, even though the archaeologists haven't found it. So let me tell you something about Mesa Verde trench kilns. Mesa Verde trench kilns are large. They're, they're really big. So they think it wasn't individual potters who were firing, but entire communities of potters were firing. So all the potters in a particular village would say, make pottery and make pottery and make pottery and save it up for a firing. And then all the potters from the village would go out at one time and fire all their pottery together in a big community kiln. Okay, uh, so maybe one of the reasons we're finding kilns in the Mesa Verde region, region is that they were doing these community firings. Maybe everybody else was doing it on more of an individual basis and therefore uh, they don't make as big of a, uh, something for archaeologists to find. Also, they, they were lining their kilns with stone slabs. That really makes them stand out. If you weren't lining your kiln with stone slabs, your your, trent, your, your pit, when I say kiln, I'm talking about your pit, your, just a hole in the ground. If you weren't lining it with stone slabs, perhaps it would be less noticeable and archaeologists would not notice it. The other thing to know about Mesa Verde trench kilns is they're, they're never in the village. They're out away from the village, sometimes miles away from the village. So they're making their pottery maybe at home, 
when they go to fire it, they're carrying their pottery out away from village to fire. And, and the reason for that, it is believed, you know, we can't get inside of their heads, these people that lived a thousand years ago, but we think the reason is uh, in order to fire all that pottery, it required a big pile of firewood. And so the pile of firewood is actually bigger than the pile of pottery. So it's, it's less labor to carry the pottery out to where the wood is than to carry the wood to the village where the pottery is. So, uh, so let me move forward to the next, um, the next screen here. Uh, so, so when we look at some of this pottery from these other areas in the map, and I'll go back to the map and reference it as I go forward, um, we see pottery that is bright white and, uh, and black. So this is Cibola whiteware, okay? And if I bring you back to the map really quick, Cibola whiteware is just, just south of the Mesa Verde Trench Kilns. You can see it there, pretty much central on the map. And, and these people were making this beautiful black on white pottery. Well, the paint, the black paint they were using is actually reduced iron. So they had to keep the oxygen away from that iron in order to get it to turn black. Also, they had to keep the oxygen away from that slip because generally white clays don't fire white. So let me show you a couple of examples here. Uh, this is a pot uh, that I got from Bob Casillas. Uh, Bob Casillas is a potter in Colorado. Uh, it's a replica. Um, and this was fired in a way that it was allowed to oxidize the slip. So this white slip, this white slip turned kind of a eh, tan, buff, cream, you know, color. Even though the organic paint is in place, uh, the, the white didn't turn white. And the, and the reason is most white clays have some iron or other minerals in them. So if they're allowed to fire in a place where they, there is oxygen available, they will they will oxidize, okay? So when we go back and we look at um, these ancient pots and we see that they're, that white is just white, white, white. Well, that tells us something. That tells us that they were fired somewhere where these pots were separated from oxygen. Well, that's not so easy to accomplish. And, and I'll talk about my experiences with, with trying to smother pottery in the past. But here's my ladle I made a couple years ago. You may have seen that video. Uh, if not, you can go back and find it. Uh, and you can see that my blacks, my blacks are, they're okay, but they're a little bit, they're a little bit brownish. They've got a little bit of maybe a purpley, dark red hue to them. Not as black as the pictures of this pottery here on the screen, huh? Uh, and that is because a little bit of oxygen leaked in. This was, this was smothered, but it was fired on the surface. It was on the surface of the ground, and then I put sand over it. So uh, oxygen, a little bit of oxygen was able to leak in and cause that r the black paint to turn uh, reddish color. And so... The fact that this Cibola whiteware is white, 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 and they've reduced that iron to black, 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 uh, that tells me something. That tells me something about that they must have been firing in a hole in the ground. And here's another type. Okay, this is um, uh, this is a Socorro black on white. So if we go over here, uh, this would be one of those Rio Abajo whitewares. So on the right side of the map there on the in central New Mexico, uh, that would be one of those. And again, uh, the paint is reduced iron. So if this was oxidized, uh, that black would turn, even a little bit of oxygen would turn that black kind of brownish, reddish color. A lot of oxygen would turn it bright red. That's literally iron on the pot. So the fact that it's black, it must have done something uh, something serious to keep the oxygen away. It had to have been smothered in a hole in the ground. I mean, that's that's the logical way to... And we're just making assumptions because archaeologists haven't found any evidence again, okay? So uh, that's that Rio Bajo. Now look at the bottom of the map, okay? Down in southwestern New Mexico where it says Membrous Whitewares. That's another one of those. And the Membrous Whitewares, again, uh, really, really good blacks and really, really good whites, which tell you that they're taking the oxygen away. So again, probably smothered in a hole in the ground in order to get those kind of effects. Uh, so, so even though the only evidence of this this pit firing uh, that we have is up in the Mesa Verde area, all of these other areas, Tucson, Cibola Whiteware, Abajo, members, and, and possibly others that I'm not aware of. These are the ones that I'm wide, broadly aware of uh, because of my study of Southwestern prehistoric pottery. These are, these are potteries that were not only pit fired, 
uh, but reduced. They reduced uh, the irons. They re they reduced the the white slips to make um, to make a bright white uh, and not see not creamy. You did you would not see this, or very rarely would you see that creamy color in any of the potteries from this area. I mean, mistakes happen everywhere. Mistakes happened uh, a thousand years ago as much as they do today. So. Certainly, there are exceptions to all these rules. There's plenty of examples of pottery that have creamy slips or where that black paint is turned red. But as a, gen as a generality, to generalize about these potteries, they were fired in such a way that there was no oxygen allowed to get to them. So we can make assumptions based on that about how they were fired. So um, let's, uh, let's dig into one of these examples. And the one I'm going to talk about first is uh is Mesa Verde black on white so because we have a we know more about Mesa Verde firing than any of the others because they have archaeologists have excavated dozens of these trench kilns up there and so we do know something about it we can use this as kind of our baseline moving forward uh, on figuring out how these were done okay so this is what Mesa Verde black on white looks like this was taken at um, some kind of a little museum in in Cortez Colorado so right in the heart of that Mesa Verde country. Um, and uh, this is what those trench kilns look like. So these pictures came from a guy named Owen Severance, uh, who I've met at the kiln conference a number of times. And he's done a lot of hiking around down there in southeast Utah, uh, identifying these different ruins and stuff, but also these trench kilns. And so he's got lots and lots of pictures of them. These were in a, an, a publication called Pottery Southwest, which is an archaeological publication that talks about the prehistoric pottery of the American Southwest. And he had written uh, some information in there. And, and, and I'll go into it more in a, in a little bit. But for the most part, that's where these pictures came from. These are Owen Severance's. Uh, this is a great example of a trench kiln. You can see the, uh, the rock outline of the kiln. Some of those rocks are still vertical, where they were set in that uh, pit, you know, on a vertical way. And then you've got down towards the front, you've got all those little bits. Those are kiln furniture. So what they do is they build a, a bed of coals in the pit. Then they stack rocks on top of those coals, and they stack the pottery on top of those rocks. Those rocks that are on the bottom, those are kiln furniture. Those hold the pottery up above the coals so they don't get dark spots on them. And so the, these bits of rocks in here are bits of kiln furniture that have been chunked out of the pit. Uh, and so this is what they look. I've got a few pictures from Owen's article here. This one's interesting because you can kind of see the depression there. There's, there's still literally a depression, and you can see that the soil in the center of that pit is darker. It's kind of a, a gray color because of charcoal and ash. It's not um, it's not brown like the surrounding soil. So this is really interesting. You can't see the really, on this one, at least I don't see the rock outline as much as I just see that kind of rectangular, almost like grave-shaped uh, uh, depression in the ground. And, uh, and then one more. This is another one with those vertical rock slabs. So my question is always... Um, would archaeologists even have found these, given that they're miles away, or they could be miles, but given that they're a ways away from the village? Um, would they even have noticed these if they didn't have those rocks sticking up? Those rocks, you know, you're walking across the desert and you come up on those rocks, it just screams, you know, human activity. Somebody was here and, and built something. But if those rocks weren't sticking up, would anybody even notice this? Yeah, the, the ground, the earth, again on this one, you can see there's kind of a darker shade of earth in the center. Um, but see, let me go back here. Look look here. Um, right? So we only have trench kilns up there in the Mesa Verde area. So let's say this Cibola area, Rio Abajo, members area. If, if an archaeologist is just walking across the country, out away from the village, would he notice those spots? There's, there's a good chance these, that, like I said, these people were probably all pit firing, but they have not found, identified a single one. So uh, were, are they even noticeable if they're not rock lining them like that? I, I don't know. I'm just saying uh, there's something, so something going on because they were making the pottery. We just have to figure out how they were making it. Okay, so that's the end of those. Uh, or is there one more? Let me see. That's one more. So there, there's another trench kiln. Uh, that has been identified up there. So um, I'll show you how um, these replicators, people that replicate Mesa Verde black and white pottery do it. So like I said, they build their trench kiln with here, you can see the rock, uh, the, the sandstone slabs that outline the kiln uh, on the edges. And then they've got that bed of coals, a thick bed of hot coals in the bottom. They've got those little 
pieces of stone slabs in the bottom that are holding the pottery up above the charcoal. So um, then they stacked all the pottery in the kiln, like you see here. And after they've got all the pottery in, they put uh, what they call cover sherds. These are uh, historically, these would have been broken pieces of pot. So these people lived around pottery all the time. They used pottery for all sorts of things. And so if you if you go to a trash pile in one of these villages back in, you know, a thousand A.D., you, you know, you would find uh, you would find lots of broken bits of pottery. Broken pottery was abundant there, uh, right? And so they would just use bits of broken pots to cover the pots to keep the fuel from coming down on top of those pots and making them dark or black. Um, today, uh, most of these replicators don't break lots of pottery like that. And so they literally go out and make big sherds that they call cover sherds just for this purpose. But, um, but that's what we have here, uh, cover sherds covering the pottery. And then once that's done, uh, a framework of logs is built over the top of that. And then uh, it's a lot of wood is put on it. This, this thing takes a tremendous amount of fuel to fire. And then um, they light it off and it burns and it gets super hot. Um, the interesting thing to me is uh, because I'm used to firing on the surface, my fires get, my fires get, you know, 800, 850 Celsius, pretty easy. If I want to get up to like 900, I got to work at it, right? But if I built a fire this size, I could easily get up to like 950. I, I've done it before, right? You, you, you built this amount of wood on it, you could get up 950, maybe a thousand degrees Celsius because this is a heck of a fire. But the fact that that pottery is sitting down below the ground and the wood is up here on top, uh, it literally, it doesn't get as hot as you would think. It gets in the, you know, the 850 range, it, but it doesn't get up, rarely, if ever, does it get up to like 9, 950, which I would think given the size of the fire. It's just because the, the pottery is sitting down here and the, and the fire is up here above it. So it's kind of funny. It's different than I would expect. That's all I'm saying. And so once that fire burns to coals, once all that once all that burning wood it becomes a bed of coals that's just laying over the top of the fire, right? Um, then they shovel all the dirt that they dug out when they created the pit. They shovel that over the top and smother it, and that's what keeps the oxygen from getting in and turning that pottery, you know, that yellowy tan color. And then, so so uh, so there's. This is going back to Owen Severance, right? Owen Severance's article. If you want, if you want that article, let me know. I can I can link that up for you. Um, Owen was saying the one that the guy that had all the pictures of the prehistoric uh, kilns. He was saying that the um, when he finds these kilns out there, he never sees any evidence that they were smothered, that there was dirt put over the top, uh, and so he doesn't think they were smothered. And and there's there's a contingent of people, not just Owen, but there's a few that think that that these ancient trench kilns perhaps were not smothered, that they were fired in some other manner than the way they're being fired today. Uh, so uh, at the 2021 Southwest Kiln Conference in Blanding, they did an experimental firing, and this is, and this is it here. So in this firing, um, they said, we're not gonna smother it. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna allow a bed of, like a layer of ash to form on the top. And we think that ash will keep out enough oxygen that we should get the same results without smothering it. So they, this is them doing the primary fire. Then they stack the pottery in there, just like I showed you in the other ones. And they, and they put the pot and they put the cover sherds on. They did it all just the same. And they built the fire over the top and they let it go. So they fired all these pots. Um, and when they were done, they didn't put the earth over the top. They didn't smother it. And, um, and, and it was a successful firing in that the pottery all came out, nothing broke or anything, but um, they all came out like this. They all came out with that creamy, you know, warm colors on the slip. They didn't come out with good white colors like this. And so, uh, as I said before, right, I mean, if we go back and look at the, um, we go back and look at the prehistoric Mesa Verde style black on whites, uh, they had good whites. So, um, you have to think that they were, if they weren't smothering it with earth, they were smothering it with, I, see, I can't imagine what else they would have smothered it with. Um, 
Like we could say, okay, maybe they weren't using earth. And you could put um, uh, hides, right? Like deer hides over it. Uh, but that's really hot when you're doing that. Those deer hides are gonna burn, I would think. Um, even if you got them soaking wet, I think those deer hides would, would burn. I don't know what else you could smother it with that would do the job, but perhaps this is something that people can um, do some experiments with. I don't know. Uh, all I know, I don't, and I've, I've never fired pottery this way, to be clear. Um, I, I, I've watched a lot of these trench kilns being fired, but I've never done it. So I'm, I'm not an expert, um, but I, I have done enough pottery to know that smothering does the trick and not smothering does not do the trick. So um, I, I don't, and I don't know what Owen Severance is, you know, talking about when he says they def, they didn't fire because I, I don't spend time in the Four Corners area. I've never found any of these trench kilns. You know, I just don't have the background to, to talk like an expert on this. Uh, let me get back to your questions really fast and then we'll go back. I have more slides to show you and we'll dig into some whole pottery in a minute. Um, Ibrahim, when I fire pottery, some black soot sticks to the surface of the pot. It usually falls off when it continues firing, but sometimes the black color persists. Why and how do I fix it? Uh, that, that carbon on the outside of your pottery will start burning off at about 650 degrees Celsius. If you have, if you have carbon on your pot when you take it out of the fire uh, that won't come off, uh, it's because you didn't get hot enough or have enough oxygen present when that was hot enough to burn that carbon off. So you have need to keep airspace around your pot allow it to breathe a little bit so that you can get oxygen in there because you, you have to have oxygen to, to burn off that carbon. Um, and so uh, you, you, and you need to get the temperature up above, say up to 700 or more uh, Celsius. Ah, watching from Plant City, Florida. Hey there, Linda. Uh, is there any method to turn pottery to ceramic without firing? Um, no. Now you have to get up 700 degrees Celsius to turn potter, to turn clay into ceramic. You're not going to get that in the sun uh, or, or in your oven or, you know, you you got to get it really stinking hot. I hope all the good potters are well and safe. All the good potters, but not Harry Potter. <laughs> Andy, I was wondering, did you know you can find lots of already refined clay soil in the roots of fallen over trees? Yeah, I've, I've seen that. Um, who said that? Uh, that was Gup Chup. <laughs> Gup, I used to be a Forest Service firefighter for a long time, and so I've been around a lot of fallen over trees and seen, uh, depending on the soil that the tree's fall growing in, right? Uh, basically, in Arizona, this isn't a thing, right? Because we have lots of dirt on, on the ground. We walk around, you're just looking at the soil. Uh, but if you go to, you know, down to like the, the, the south, right? Let's say I'm in like Louisiana or Alabama, uh, you can't see the soil because it's got layers of, of gr grass and roots and leaves and sticks on top. The soil's down there 12, 18 inches beneath your feet. So you've got to get through it. That's why you go around to like construction sites, see where they're, where they're digging uh, ditches or if they're like a well driller where they're drilling into the ground or, or even putting in like post holes or, or, um, or telephone poles when they're augering in. Uh, any place they're getting down in there, you're, they're seeing what's under there and you can bring up clay. So if the tree is growing in clay and the tree falls over, it brings up clumps of clay and it sits there on the roots. So uh, that's a great way to find clay if you're in a place where you can't see what's beneath the ground like you can in, you know, in Arizona. Uh, I love ancient pottery. It's really fascinating. And they use their hands to make pottery. That's so beautiful. Very true. No ceramics can only, let's see. Oh, 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 my, my thing just jumped. Sorry, sorry. Above 650 for very low fire clay, uh, says Bry Lee. Uh, yes. Uh, maybe a dumb question, but could you cover the pottery pit with some sort of mud dome or some kind of paste made on site and built on top to smother it? Um, why, I would assume uh, the Kaaba, that, that's perhaps possible. Uh, were they doing it prehistorically? Probably not, or we would find evidence of it, right? Uh, maybe. I don't know. Um, but certainly there's all kinds of things we could do today, right? We could even get like a big metal bucket and smother it. You know, you could use a flower pot to smother it. Uh, you can use a lot of things to smother it. Um, you can build something ad hoc too. Um, wet mud on top of sticks or something is a definite possibility. So, um, 
it's uh it's it's all out there to be experimented with and that's what i'm trying to encourage people to do um, you don't just don't just look to me for answers or read the book find answers go go out there and, and experiment with it uh, do your do your own homework because that's that's the fun part uh, natives from kansas would build adobe kilns above their pits hmm adobe kilns above I don't believe, Briley Leppin, that any um, of the Native Americans in the United States, in the continental United States, made anything that was like a kiln. So uh, I would like to see some evidence of that, because I don't, I don't think they had kilns in, uh, you know, on the plains or the woodlands area, in, in any way. Uh, the nearest actual kilns, proper kilns, were down in Mexico, a thousand miles south of the border. Um, this thing keeps jumping around, so I apologize. Simple Roman kiln has a dome of mud that was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dr. Ratten Kaiser says that the Roman kilns had a dome of mud that was rebuilt each time. That's true, and I've seen that, and I've thought about that. Like I said, if you could put maybe green vegetation over the top and then put mud over it, then that would maybe work. Uh, and, and I don't think that mud would turn to ceramic. It wouldn't be hot enough to turn to ceramic, uh, but it would hold out the, the air. So, I mean... That's, that's definitely, there's definitely some possibilities in that area, I think. Uh, greetings from Turkey. Again, uh, Fenner, uh, welcome from Turkey. But is the, I know you're using the new spelling of Turkey. Is it still pronounced Turkey? Uh, you're so smart that you so much like a database of knowledge. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, great, great plays. It is important to process forest clay and clean it before using for pottery. You can use it all natural materials. Yeah, so, um, can we use it with all natural materials? Fine. Yeah, uh, if you've got a lot of junk in your clay, uh, be that sticks and roots or, or you know, sand and rocks, you need to get that out. So uh, depending on, like a lot of times I say, well, I dry process clay. I just grind it up and then I add the temper. But if your clay has a lot of stuff in it that you don't want there, then you have to work at getting that out. You can run it through a screen, you know, just mix it up in water and pour it through a sieve or something. Uh, there's different ways to do it. You can levigate it. But yeah, if, you're, if your clay has a lot of junk in it, you need to get some of that out of there. Yes, or, uh, and Briley says organic material can act as temper. That's true. You just don't want too much, right? So if it has some roots and sticks, that's okay. Uh, if it has some sand, that's okay. But if you have more than, say, a third of the volume is, is junk, sticks, sand, roots, then you're going to want to take some of that out. So it just depends on how much there is. Try it. If you think it doesn't have enough plasticity, clean some of it out. You know, you've got nothing to lose. It's just, it's trial and error. I'm from Turkey and Cappadocia, especially Avanos is famous with pottery work. Uh, thank you, Fenner. It's nice to have somebody here from, from Turkey. They have some amazing archaeology in Turkey. Uh, organic impurities in your clay will burn off in firing, leaving voids. Yeah, so of course, any pottery that has organic temper, hair, or, or eggshells, you know, um, certain things that'll, seashells aren't organic. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of things. People use charcoal for temper. Um, People have used manure for temper. Uh, there's a lot of organic tempers. And sometimes it's just junk, like you get clay from the roots of a tree and it's got bits of roots in it. And you're grinding that all up. That's organic temper. And, um, and, that, and that works for temper, but it does leave, makes your clay more, more porous, right? Uh, sometimes if you want your ceramics for uh, insulative purposes, it's better because those voids actually act as insulation. So for example, somebody was using uh, making cover shirts with charcoal temper because that that made it more insulative from that radiant heat that's coming from the fire so think about that it does it can have advantages too uh, Susanna says I've got an old dried cow hide I never got around to tanning might have to give that a try yeah it would be worth a shot um, neighbors needs to air needs air to glow hot maybe a pine was I don't know what that means I think I'm it makes sense that they would use the dirt that they had dug to smother. Yeah, so I, I agree with you, uh, Jereen, right? Uh, it, it, they have the dirt there already. Uh, it's logical that they would smother with the dirt. Uh, it's, it certainly provides the right uh, results. The results they're getting from those pit fires by smothering with dirt look exactly like the prehistoric stuff. So I think that, you know, the proof is in the pudding as far as that's concerned. Uh, I watched your videos on different sealing methods without sealing. If the pot was successfully fired, can it still be functional? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, a lot of these ancient people, I mean, they had, 
uh, they had methods for sealing pottery, but they didn't always go around sealing everything they had. I, a lot of times they just used it and they just as, accepted that it was going to weep a little bit, right? Or uh, they found that over time through use, it slowly kind of developed its its own seal too. So yeah, you, you can use it without sealing it. Uh, sealing it just made, a lot of times today, you know, we're using something like a coffee cup or something. We want to set it on our our table and not have it ooze coffee all over the table. And it might ruin your furniture or make a mess. And, um, but back in those days, they didn't even have furniture, right? They were sitting on the ground and the cup was sitting on the dirt next to them. They, they weren't worried about a little bit of seepage. It wasn't it wasn't ruining their day the way it would today, right? So we have different standards today. Uh, and that's uh, largely why I spend so much time talking about sealing because uh, I want people to be able to use their uh, primitive fired pottery. <clears throat> um, Fenner, which one is significant for providing the required strength, quartz or silica? Uh, both quartz and silica would make good tempering materials. Um, I, I think uh, there's a lot of ancient pottery here in the Southwest that's fired with either one of those. So um, I, I think you'd be six of one, half a dozen, the other sort sort of thing. I know you're not from America. That's a that's a figure of speech we use here. It just means that you know one's as good as the other. Uh, would clay be easier to find on low, high, or flat land? No difference at all. Clay can be found all kinds of places. So where I live, uh, most of the clay is out in the valleys right? Because that's where the streams and the rivers are that'll kind of deposit the clay. And so you go up in the mountains, you find like granite and stuff, and it's, it's harder to find clay. But that doesn't mean there isn't clay up there. Uh, sometimes uh, an ancient seabed was, was lifted up by, you know, out of the earth through earthquakes and stuff over the course of millennia. And you can find really wonderful clay on top of a mountain. Uh, so it, it, there's no rhyme or reason to it. There's, clay can be found all over. Or maybe there was a glacier up in the mountains and that glacier uh, created clay that's found uh, up in some valley up way up high in the mountains. Uh, so don't, don't uh, restrict yourself necessarily. I, I think if you were just looking for a place to start, uh, a river valley is probably the most likely, but um, you know, clay can be found anywhere. Uh, Bubba 2525, do your own homework. But uh, WH specifically told us not to do our own homework research. Well, you, you, if you're listening to the government, uh, Bubba, you're in trouble already. Backcountry Media, I was wondering, after seeing the photos of the old pit fire remnants and those specific locations, were they fired pots found in those or are they usually left undisturbed? Uh, were there fired pots? Okay. Uh, so when they have those kilns, those pit fire kilns, those trench kilns, they call them, um, I'm going to go over today. So if that bothers anybody, uh, just so you know, um, I'll show you um, those. Let me go back real quick. Generally, when they ha when they find these uh, trench kilns, they excavate them, and there's no pottery left in them. They 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 took all the the natives took the pottery home with them. Those that was valuable, and they left bits of broken pottery, they'll find bits of cover sherds, anything that might have blown up in the fire, uh, that sort of, lots of char and ash. Um, but they have, they have found whole pots. Uh, in fact, uh, I think I remember reading that there was even a kiln that was full of pots that had just been walked away from for some reason. So, I mean, you know, it's just like us. Things happen sometimes, you know. Uh, you're out firing your pottery and, um, you know, maybe a neighboring tribe comes along, starts shooting arrows at you or I don't know, a grizzly bear shows up and chases you away, or I, you know, rainstorm, I don't know, but stuff happens, you know, and, and occasionally they have found pottery in there. Uh, if you're wanting to learn more about the, um, uh, the trench kiln firings, uh, this is Clint Swink's book, Messages from the High Desert, and um, it's a $50 book, but it's got a lot of information, it's a thick book, so uh, they, you can buy that on Amazon, uh, and it goes into uh, how to, not only how to recreate that Mesa Verde style pottery, but a lot of information about firing these trench kilns. A lot more than I know. Uh, Riot X, I have yet to gain experience in glazing. Can you please mention the most simplistic one with basic materials that can be found around your home? <laughs> uh, Riot X, I'm not, I'm not a big glazer myself. Uh, when I make glaze out of natural materials, uh, I make glaze paint because that's what we had in the prehistoric Southwest. There was an all over glaze here. Um, and so my, my recipe for, I have, some, I have some videos on this you can check out, but uh, my recipe for, for black 
glaze-based paint is, um, uh, I find Galena. So Galena is, um, it's lead ore. I grind it up. I grind it up as fine as I can. Uh, and then I roast it. So I, I put it next to my fire when I'm firing pottery on top of the fire so that it can get hot. And I stir it with a stick every once in a while. So what I'm doing, uh, Galena is lead sulfate. Uh, lead sulfate. So I'm, I'm trying to get rid of some of that sulfur. And so I'm, ox I'm literally oxidizing my Galena. And by getting it hot and stirring it, you're allowing that sulfur to uh, get, you know, leave. I don't know the scientific term for it. You're getting rid of the sulfur. You're burning it off. Um, and then we have, uh, at that point, if you oxidized it well enough, you basically have lead oxide, right? Uh, then I use that, that roasted galena, roasted ground galena, and I mix that with um, copper carbonate mostly. So copper carbonate is any rock like um, um, uh, azurite, malachite, chrysocolla. They're just those green and blue, soft green and blue uh, copper carbonates that are common around you know, copper mines, which we have a lot of here in Arizona. Uh, so then I mix the lead and the copper uh, and then a little bit of clay to make it st uh, stick and some organic binder, which can be like um, tree sap or, or like boiled down plant material, just something to make it sticky. Uh, you could even use like egg yolk or something uh, and then paint it on. And then uh, if your fire gets hot enough, uh, it should form a glaze. So that is, uh, that's the down and dirty how to make a glaze out of nature. Uh, Felix, apart from grog, is it safe to use feldspar for temper? I believe so. I think feldspar would make probably a great temper. It's a, it's an ingredient in granite. I know feldspar is, and I've used ground granite for temper a lot of times. In fact, I know other people that use ground granite as well. Andy, uh, Tucson, Arizona, uh, rep <laughs> Pap, yeah, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's appropriate that you used uh, the fire uh, emoji on that comment pap because it is like fire outside in tucson right now it's like been over 100 degrees for the last i don't know two weeks angel duncan when you consider they went from cooking in leaky hide pots a slowly seeping pot yeah that's right that's right it's all it's all what you're used to right you're you're cooking in in a basket or a hide pot or something and you go to pottery you're excited it leaks way less it's all what you're used to um uh, Pat Master says, hit the like button. So uh, you you guys got to do it. Hit that like button and help me out, okay? Uh, where can you fire clay if you live in a wet climate? Um, yeah, that it, people fire clay in wet climates. Just um, build a fire on the ground before. Find a day when it's not raining, when it's not likely to rain. Build a fire on the ground an hour or so ahead of time and just dry out the ground. Or you can get... Uh, you know, you can get some dry sand or something and put down just so you have a, a good dry foundation. Uh, and then, um, or you, you lay down bricks or something, anything to just kind of give you a dry, so you're not getting water vapor coming up through your firing uh, and then you just fire. But you have to have a day when it's not going to rain. So, um, you know, maybe that's not a possibility. Uh, some of the uh, potters up at Hopi, they'll build little shelters, little, uh, li little roofs open-sided shelters that they fire under. That way they can fire, <clears throat> uh, even if it's raining or snowing or something, uh, you know. So that's another possibility, I suppose. Uh, what is the contribution of volcanic tuff to the augmentation of quality of clay? Uh, volcanic tuff is, um, you can use it for, for a temper. I don't know what else to say about it. Um, some volcanic ash can, can weather into snectite clay. Uh, but yeah, volcanic ash makes great temper. Another thing about the tree root clay is that it smells like sewage. Uh, well, a lot of clays are like that. A lot of clays will get stinky if you mix them up and let them sit for a while. Uh, there's there's bacteria and stuff that are growing in there. So uh, you can try adding, um, I don't know, people add different things to it. I can't think what it is. Maybe a bleach or vinegar or something they're adding to it to kill that uh um, that smell. And, and I don't know because I don't deal with that very often, that smelly clay, although I have. Um, the best advice I can give you is if you dry process, if you, if you just grind up that dry clay and, and mix the temper into it, then when you're ready, <clears throat> put the water in it, mix it up, and then use it. Use it. <coughs> Excuse me, I need a drink. Just use that clay as soon as you can before it has a chance. Because usually it'll be three, four, five, six days before it starts smelling bad. Use Mix that clay up and use it right away before it has a chance to stink. All right, I'm going to go back to my um, 
uh, to my slideshow. We're gonna get through this. And like I said, I'm gonna go over. Uh, so uh, if you have some place to be, uh, you can watch this later. Okay, so we're done talking about Mesa Verde. Let's talk about the Holocom because when I when I uh, when I showed the map, this Holocom pottery, you, you'll see that the Holocom, uh, they're down there in the bottom left. They're not they're not in my my pit. So the the blue bubbles are are the ones that I assumed were doing pit firing pottery, right? Because they had that white white clay and and black reduced iron paint. Uh, but the Holocom, you know. Why am I talking about them? Holocom pottery is oxidized. It's red, and the the clay is a, a creamy buff or brown color. So, uh, obviously, they fired in an oxidation atmosphere. Why are we talking about the Holocom today? Well, uh, when I talked earlier about where they had found evidence of firing, where archaeologists had found evidence of firing, I said Mesa Verde was the only place where they had evidence of of. Uh, you know, these trench kilns. Most of these places, they haven't found any evidence of firing. Well, in Snake Town, uh, Howry, Emil Howry, uh, found evidence of, of pottery firings. And I'm going to show you some of that. So he found uh, whole pottery making workshops. There were bins for mixing up clay, uh, like, like troughs built in the ground for, for kneading clay. And he found these Firing pits. <clears throat> this one's this one particular. <clears throat> this particular pit is a little weird, and I don't. I've looked at it over the years a number of times, and I can't figure it out because there's kind of a hole, but then there seems to be like a like a plateau in the middle, a little uh, an, a raised area. So I don't get it. So um, we'll come back to that one. But look at these ones. Okay, look at the one that's kind of center and a little to the right. Just. Um, Straight over there, see? Look at that. It's just it's the perfect circle dug down into the ground. And these, this is about three feet, oh no, yeah, three feet across and about a foot deep. So it's relatively deep, right? Uh, if you could put a good sized jar in there and, and it would be below ground level, even with a layer of coal on the bottom. Uh, and of course, all the sherds, those could be bits of like either broken pots or cover sherds that were used. Uh, the one... The hole that's at the bottom, uh, the bottom right of your screen, it's even smaller than the, the other one I showed you. Again, perfect circle, and then there's some good-sized shirts in the center where they would have used them as cover shirts. Unbelievable that they to think they could have been firing oxidized pottery in these holes in the ground. I I wish I could see how they fired, and we can't uh, because we don't have. <clears throat> We don't know how the how the Holocom fired, uh, and I'll talk about some of the, you know, the living groups in the Southwest that are descendants from these people and how they fire. So, in this, this is the, <clears throat> this is the whole clay, uh, a pottery making studio area. On the left, on the left side of your screen, those are those are clay kneading troughs. So these would be a trough shaped depression dug into the ground that was lined with clay and allowed to dry. And then they would go in there and they would mix up their clay and knead it. This is where they would mix their clay at. That way they weren't doing it right on the... Remember, they had no furniture. They were not doing it right on the dirt where you could get junk in your clay, but in a trough that is already lined with dried clay. So even if it picks up some bits, it's already the right material. So on the right side of the screen, those are the firing pits. So you can see <coughs> they're fairly large. They're fairly deep. And there's quite a bit of broken pottery around them. Uh, also found in those holes was ash and charcoal among those uh, sherds. So uh, interesting stuff. So how are they doing it? So let's look at some historical examples of firing in that same area. So this is a this is a historic picture, maybe turn of the 20th century uh, Mojave. So the Mojaves are farther to the west, over by the Colorado River, near the California-Arizona line. Um, and so they're not necessarily the descendants of the Holocom, but, but their, their people were neighbors to the Holocom. They certainly could have been influenced by them. And we can see they are firing in a, in a hole in the ground. It's, it's a pretty big hole. I mean, there's a lot of space between the edge of the pit and that first pot. I mean, there's got to be a couple feet there. Um, and they're sitting on some kind of a, maybe a metal grate that's lifted up on rocks. Um, so interesting that they are firing in a hole because most of these people 
down here in, <clears throat> in southern Arizona. Do not fire in pits at all. So this is <clears throat> this is an example of a, a autumn firing uh, that's here in southern Arizona. And these people are considered the descendants of the Holocom. And here she's firing with manure right on the surface of the ground. Right, no, no pit whatsoever. Okay. And then uh, here's one a little more recent. I think this was like early 80s. And we can see another autumn uh, woman and uh, again, descendants of the Holocom. We, she does have a, a shallow pit, but it's very shallow. It's not, it's not that one foot deep with the straight sides that the Holocom had. So uh, again, similar, but different. Uh, now this is a uh, Tarahumara. So they're down in uh, Chihuahua, Mexico. Uh, again, firing on the surface of the ground. Not the one I meant to see. I think we were out of order here. Uh, okay, so yeah, other people that fire on the surface there. Um, so so we we've, we've identified that the whole com fired in fired oxidized pottery in pits, and that nobody today seems to be doing that. So it's interesting, and I don't know anybody that's done much experiments on this. This is something I hope to explore soon uh, to try to understand. Uh, here's another historic example. Uh, I believe this is um, this is Hopi or one of the New Mexico Pueblos, perhaps. Uh, I, I don't have the details. Uh, she's got a pile. This is common today, too. She's got a pile of manure there, cow manure. And she's got like a piece of tin over the top and some like tarps around it and stuff, trying to keep that manure dry. And she's going to fire that pottery there. So then she has a little wall built around it. And that's to kind of protect it from the breeze. So if she goes out to fire and it's a little bit breezy, uh, she just goes ahead and fires anyway because the wall adds a little protection from the breeze. Again, though, the point is that she's she's firing on the surface of the ground, which is pretty common all over the Southwest. So what I'm trying to show you is that um, if we go back to ancient times, uh, there was a lot of pit firing going on in the Southwest. So all of these blue bubbles, these were probably all some sort of pit firing. Uh, the Holocom down there, <clears throat> the green area on the bottom left, they were also probably pit firing in some method and possibly possibly other areas of the Southwest I'm not aware of, like uh, up in the Fremont country in Utah and, and other places were probably also uh, pit firing in some way. So uh, <clears throat> there was a lot of pit firing going on and yet uh, today or even in historic times, there's very little pit firing going on in the Southwest. So um, in order to figure out how to do that, we need to ask ourselves, um, how how would I go about <clears throat> how would I go about pit firing pottery today if I wanted to recreate some of that ancient pottery? Well, you know, there's the electric kiln, but that that wouldn't be the right that wouldn't be the right tool for the job uh, because um, you can't really reduce in an electric kiln. You don't have the right atmosphere. Those uh, when you're burning wood or gas or anything, you know, you're creating a, what they call combustion or, or reduction gases, right? Gases that replace oxygen and keep the pot from oxidizing. But with these electric heating elements, they don't create any of that. So it, an electric kiln is a great way to oxidize pottery. In fact, um, <clears throat> what archaeologists often do is they'll get ancient sherds from the ruins and they'll throw them in an electric kiln and then that'll give them a baseline on what colors they fire to. And then they can look that compare that against the ancient pottery shirt and see what color it was there and then say, oh, well, this was fired in a, a reduction atmosphere because I put it in the electric kiln and it turned red or this was fired in a, uh, a neutral atmosphere, uh, you know, because it was red, but it wasn't as red as the electric kiln made it. So electric kilns are great for doing that kind of science to help you understand how they were fired, but um, you, you, can't, you can't reduce in an electric kiln. Uh, and so... Um, you know, how have some people done it? Well, uh, the Thornburgs, uh, they made some really beautiful membrous replicas. Uh, I have one here. Hold on, let me grab it. This is my membrous, uh, this is my uh, membrous uh, seed jar replica. I bought it real cheap long ago because it was broken. It's broken in two and I glued it together. Um, but this is reduced iron. This is uh, literally... Uh, reduced iron paint, so really nice, solid black, 
and a really good white. Uh, and this was fired in this, uh, this big adobe kiln. So this is how they were firing. And uh, they call it, they call their method an earthen tunnel. So it's, it's kind of, it's kind of a pit firing, uh, because the only difference is, uh, you know, it, it has, it has airflow at the bottom, whereas most pits, they're just, they're a dead end for air, right? There's no air getting into the pit. Uh, so you have to try to get oxygen down in there to oxidize the pottery, to, um, to, uh, to burn the wood. Um, so a lot of people, uh, they, they'll cut little channels in to let oxygen in underneath the pots or something. Uh, if you were digging the, the, when the Thornbergs first made one of these, it wasn't adobe like this. They literally were on the side of an arroyo bank, so a, a stream bank. They dug in here, and then they dug in here and created this in the stream bank. And so their theory has always been that the ancient members potters may have fired this way. If they had, there would be no evidence of it today because it would all erode out and it wouldn't exist anymore if they were built on the side of a stream bank 700 years ago, right? So uh, that's, that's something to consider, uh, a way to do it. Um, and, that's, and they were able to do it very successfully for a long time. They sold a lot of really nice replicas that were fired in this, um, this kind of kiln. And this type of kiln uh, was used in ancient times down in Mexico, you know, a thousand miles south of here down in Mexico. They actually had this technology prehistorically. We know they did because archaeologists have found it there. So there is a connection uh, to other places that have used similar things. Now, I, I, um, I have fired a lot in like a shallow pit. Uh, and, and, and the reason, the reason I, I shape them this way, first of all, you want some space between the pot and the edge of the pit. And also, if your walls are straight, you have trouble getting oxygen down in there. So you find that the stuff in the bottom all comes out kind of dark, kind of carbony, because it doesn't get enough oxygen to, to oxidize. Um, but if I, if I dig the walls kind of angled in like this, then uh, it's easier to get oxygen down into there. And your pots will come out nice and bright and oxidized. Um, now, as I said, we looked at some of those Holcomb kilns, uh, those Holcomb firing pits, and they were vertical sided. So... Um, this is something to think about and maybe try in the future. Here's another one of those shallow pit firings that I've done. This is after the fire's all burned down to, to charcoal. You can see it there laying on top of it. It's a good way to, it's a good way to fire. Um, but once again, it, it's not, it's not those sharp sided pits that the Holcombs were using. Uh, so there must be something to that. So this is when I was firing, uh, this, uh, this canteen. This is the first fire. So I fired it twice. Um, that was the first firing. Oh, can I make that thing play again? I don't know. Uh, that was the first firing and it was, it wasn't deep enough, right? That was kind of my shallow pit idea. Like I was showing you earlier, it's kind of angled down and, and it's, um, and it, it's so that the top of the pot is well above the surface of the ground. <clears throat> so I fired it like that. And then I, I, I put dirt around it and I, and I got it out and it came out kind of reddish colored. And so then I thought, well, I need to figure out a different way to do this. Oh, that's in the wrong place, isn't it? Okay, let's see. And so I took it out the next day and I fired it again. And you can see here, this is not showing the firing, but this is the, the pre-firing where I'm preheating the, the pot and the rocks. Much deeper hole and much steeper sides, right? Because I want it, I want to make sure this thing does not oxidize. I want the blacks to come out black. And so I had a lot better success uh, this time. This is my last slide. But you can see it was much better uh, because it was in a, a nice deep hole. Now, when you're in a deep hole like that with steep sides, like I said, you have to you have to work harder to make sure it gets hot enough that you don't end up with dark spots uh, and, uh, and it gets nice and clean. You want to burn all the carbon out. Just like one of the comments on this uh, live stream early on was, uh, I fire, but my stuff comes out kind of dark. And that's that carbon you have to burn out. So that's that's always a challenge to burn all the carbon off of the pot. So um, it's not always easy. And when you're firing in a, a rather restrictive pit like that, you've got to work all the harder to make sure that you're getting that cleaned up, especially before you smother it. Because once you smother it, you're done. You're done. <clears throat> you also have to make sure that you... Um, 
all that fire has burned down to coals before you smother it. Because if you've got anything in there that's still burning with like orange flame, uh, you're going to have carbon in there with your pot and it may come out dark as well. So it's a, it's a real challenge. Uh, so that's kind of where I'm at with this. Uh, my idea, this was, uh, my idea on, on going forward is I want to try, uh, I'm going to build a pit in my yard. Okay, so I'm going to use bricks. I'm going to use those uh, just regular bricks and I'm going to use some clay that I, I'm just going to get like a truckload of clay, mix it up, and I'm going to build a little brick pit. <clears throat> I want to keep the sides relatively, I don't want them straight, but I want them to be relatively steep. And then I want to make myself a little test pot of some sort. It's just the right size for firing in it. And I want to do, I want to try different things to try to figure out how to best fire in a pit. Because, as I said, I think... I think a lot of people in the ancient Southwest were firing in pits. And we just don't fully understand how they were doing it. So I'm hoping to try to uh, dig into that and, and see if I can figure out uh, what the secret is. Oh, there's that like button again. So you can hit that if you're thinking of it. Uh, and that's uh, that's what I hope to do <clears throat> pretty soon. Uh, I, right now I'm filming a video for making that double jar, which is one of the last pots for the ancient pottery challenge. And then when I'm done with that, uh, I'm going to start building on this uh, on this pit and I'm going to do some experimental pit firings here in my yard. So I look forward, look for that in the future. Let me go back and uh, see what we're doing on the chat. Uh, ash has been mentioned as an ingredient in glazing. How safe is it considered that ash has some caustic elements? I have no idea. I don't know anything about um, uh, glazing. Uh, Dr. Rattenkaiser, I use clay that I find under fallen trees. Sometimes it smells like mushrooms. <laughs> Uh, CK, you were talking about making glazes. Do you have any photos online showing pots you glazed with glaze you made? Um, if you're talking to, to me, uh, Carol, um, I have a couple videos on glaze-based paints, uh, and that's it. So, uh, probably not what you're looking for. Uh, the raised area allows ash to drop away and allowing good oxidation. Fennel, could you give some information in a nutshell about sintering, please? Sintering. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. Uh, the way I understand it, uh, sintering is when uh, the material starts to melt a little bit and becomes permanent. And I think, uh, I think uh, that's what happens with, say, uh, when your when your iron no longer rubs off, it's sintered a little bit. Uh, but I don't. I don't have much details to give you about it. Um, simply Pam from Saint David. Hey, that's not far from me. Uh, notice the surface fire use fuel that blocks air. Loose sticks as fuel, as you usually do, Andy. Um, you know, there's different kinds of fuel, right? Um, you can use um, cow manure, and it really, you know, blocks a lot of that air out. Uh, also, the other thing that blocks air really good are, are cover sherds, and you'll see a lot of those used. In fact, if you look at those uh, pictures of the Holcom uh, uh, firing pits that I showed earlier, uh, there's a lot of cover sherds in there. So uh, that definitely blocks air. Uh, Pap says, yeah, we used those to fire ceramic tile artwork in Las Air Terrace. Looks like the rocket stove. Yeah, it does. Dakota fire hole. Very similar to a Dakota fire hole. Same, uh, same principle for sure. Uh, can you burn off carbon by refiring in an electric kiln? Absolutely. But you, but you may change, uh, you may change the, the look of your pottery too. Especially if you, if you're going for reduced or anything like that. Uh, you know, you may lose uh, fire clouds if you want some fire clouds on your pottery. You know, these little dark areas that we get based on where the fuel was sitting and stuff. You fire it in an electric kiln, you're going to lose all of that. So uh, it's something to keep in mind. Catherine says, thanks for this episode. Uh, thanks, Catherine. I appreciate that. Do you have any tips for getting a deeper pit hot enough? Yeah, so when they fire those, uh, those Mesa Verde style trench kilns, um, the rule is... That you want, when you stack the pottery in it, you want the bottoms of the pots. The pots are stacked upside down in the pit, right? They're stacked upside down in the pit. You want the bottoms of the pots to be right about at ground level. Because if you get them too deep in the pit, ground level's up here, then um, you're not going to, you might not oxidize them well enough to get all that carbon burned off. So that's kind of the goal. Uh, you've got those pots as high up in the in that pit as you can while still having them below ground level. So, um... That's the that's the secret, um, and then getting them hot enough is another is another trick because, like I said, you're down in the ground. You're having trouble getting enough oxygen to burn a fire, 
which is why what they do is they'll build a, a what they call a primary fire. So they've got a bed of coals under all that pottery, okay? And that coal, once you start burning it, that coal starts combusting again and, and heating it up. So you've got coal below the pot and you've got the fire above the pot. So uh, they're literally, you know, a sandwich there. You've got pottery in the middle, you've got fire below and fire above. And that helps get them up to temp. Um, and, and get yourself a thermocouple if you really want to know what's going on in there. And, and set that thermocouple probe down inside your trench kiln underneath the pottery with the probe coming up through the coals and then the pot stacked up here and measuring the temperature under the, the pot. That'll help you a lot to know if you're, what temperatures you're getting down in there. Because when you've got that fire on top, your highest temperatures might be at the top of the pot or the very top. But you want to make sure you've got good temperature all the way to the bot, the deepest part of the kiln that you're trying to fire pottery in. Um, I have centered brake pads, says Andrew Sock. Every pot I've pit fired always has thermal shock cracks in the base on the inside where the walls connect to the base. Never heard of some any granite cut pots. No, I haven't heard of any uh, granite pots from Egypt, uh, but it sounds interesting. Um, so thermal shock means the pot either heated up too fast or cooled down too fast. So generally, uh, I have more trouble in my surface firings with thermal shock than people do that fire in pit fires. So, <clears throat> for example, uh, 2015 Southwest Kiln Conference. No, might have been 2016. It was in Springerville. And, um, and I made a bunch of pottery to fire. And Clint Swink made a bunch of pottery that he wanted me to fire for him. So he made like, he made some Salado pottery. He made like some St. John's black on red or something. He made a bunch of like polychromes and, and red on, black on reds and such, a redware pottery, which isn't his usual thing. He's mostly into black on white. And then he said, here, Andy, you have more experience firing these things. You fire them for me. I broke them all. I broke all his pottery um, because he was able to get away with like 12 or 15% temper because he was firing in that pit. Uh, because I'm firing on the surface, my temperatures come up really rapidly and then they come back down really rapidly. So pots, clay that doesn't have enough temper in that environment will, will thermal shock quickly. Uh, so if you're firing in a pit, uh, usually the temperature rises much slower because the pot's down here in the ground and then the fire's up here and it's just slowly, slowly, slowly the temperature climbs. Um, so if your pottery, if you're firing in a pit, and you still have trouble with thermal shock, I would say you haven't used nearly enough temper to overcome uh, you know, what you need to do for that kind of firing. Uh, lots and lots of temper, especially if you're using commercial clay. Um, add temper to it. All right, what are we at here? 10.42, so about almost 15 minutes uh, over. Um, please um, smash that like button. It'll help me. If you haven't already, um, think about subscribing to my channel. Uh, you know, the other thing uh, you might want to do is, uh, oh, I'm lost myself here. I don't know where it went. I can't subscribe. Web address, there it is. Uh, check out my website, ancientpottery.how. On there I've got, um, I've got online master classes. I've got tools. I've got uh, like slip clays and gourd scrapers and polishing stones. I've got all kinds of things that you might need if you're, trying to do this kind of stuff, as well as I've got articles, articles about how to recreate Anazazi pottery, how to recreate members pottery. Uh, I've got articles about uh, tempering potter, tempering clay, uh, all kinds of information there. That That's free. That's free. Uh, sign up for my newsletter. It comes out once a month and uh, there's always a 20% coupon for my store in the newsletter. So um, check that out if you would. Uh, I appreciate you um, coming to the live stream today and I hope you have a great weekend. And I will catch you guys next time. Thank you.